Okay, so I just want to make it very clear that I have not played every Paper Mario game in the series. I finished Super, and I basically played the first chapter of Origami King, but I have not played the N64 version, Sticker Star, or Color Splash. But I think I can still say with confidence that this is the best Mario RPG I've ever played. I go on and on about, about how good the story is, and the amazing characters, and Chapter 3 being so darn good. And while I would love to make something like this, just focusing on why Chapter 3 is so great, today, I want to focus on why the concept of Paper Mario games as a whole is so fundamentally brilliant. And it solves what I like to call the gameplay story paradox. So, uh, what is this paradox, you might be asking? Well, let's compare two other Mario games as an example. Mario & Luigi Superstar and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. So let's start with Mario & Luigi. You know, this, this is actually my favorite game as a kid, and I still love it to this day. It has a pretty good story, a very challenging final boss, it's a very fun Mario & Luigi gameplay. By the way, if you want to play Superstar Saga, there is a virtual console on the Wii U and a remake on the 3DS. But anyway, on to the point. This game is a very enjoyable campaign. You explore many different areas looking for the Beanstar to stop Cacoletta from taking over the world. Overall, a simple plot for a simple game. And it works well for what it's trying to accomplish. And you are likely to spend quite a few hours trying to beat the game and get very skilled. However, once you beat the final boss, well, that's it. There's nothing more to do except spend time tediously looking for beans just hidden in the ground and also try and get a high score on the Mario Bros. remake package with it. But the thing is, not even Mario Bros. counts as board game because it was already an arcade game and the exact same version was on all the other Mario GBA games. Future titles in the Mario & Luigi series try to solve this by adding basically arenas to fight bosses again, but harder. This thing is, those arenas are all it has, and some of them are really hard, forcing you to do tedious grinding of enemies, which we all know is a terrible trope. So hard that you can finally beat Bowser X in Mario & Luigi Bowser's Inside Story. However, I can tell the team was trying to solve this given that there is an opportunity to play Dream Team in hard mode after beating the game. That's not even unique, it's just a reused concept. Overall, I still love the Mario & Luigi games, and I can replay them every year and still have a blast. They are good games. However, now it's time to look at Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and the thing with that game is it never ends! As long as you keep loving the game, you can get better and better and fight more people online and never 100%. It's impossible. Like, if I challenge you to 100% Mario & Luigi game, you choose a game, beat it, then find all the beans and beat the arena. If I told you to, for example, 100% a Mario Kart game, well, the only one you could do that one with is DS, and even then, it's basically it's just mission mode. What I just described to you is the gameplay story paradox. If you turn the gameplay up, there's not going to be any intriguing story. You won't have the satisfaction of beating a 100% game. But focus on the story, and your game has an end. People will stop playing. This game like say Smash Bros, you'll beat the story and never come back to it, only play online matches. Most competitive games are gameplay focused, most RPGs are story focused. I mean, it's called a role-playing game for a reason. However, the Paper Mario series might not be able to fix the paradox. You can tell that the team was trying their hardest. Let's use the main game of this discussion, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, as an example. So you know how Mario and Luigi would have the harder bosses in the arena? Yeah, well, Paper Mario's arena has 100 battles! Including with Bone Tail, who has the most health out of any boss in the game. Also, you know the beans? Now you have star pieces and shine sprites. And instead of just looking on the floor for, like, weird-looking spots, these ones have you combining clever game mechanics in order to solve a sort of mini-puzzle. And speaking of puzzles, Paper Mario is full of puzzles. Normally, I wouldn't like this. One of the reasons I don't really play Zelda that much, or the Breath of the Wild, of course, because that game's amazing, is that the puzzles are too difficult. Even to beat the Thousand Year Door, I had to look up a guy. Remember once they think, How is this puzzle so bad? It's so stupid! I always thought that it was a mastery control and knowledge that I was just too dumb to solve. I never felt it was the game's fault that the puzzles were too hard. I knew that if I was having trouble with a puzzle, it was due to my own inability to solve them. 
by the time you get to the final chapter, the game has mentally trained you to be able to solve any puzzle it throws your way. It is one of the reasons why the Puzzle Power Chapter 8 is so beloved. Now you might think, uh, cool, that takes a long time, then you will not just send it and you're done. Right? Wrong! The Paper Mario games are designed in the ways that you can always get better. There's a very high skill cap that you can reach to the point where you can beat every boss without getting hit once. Due to TTYD's reflect feature. And there's always funny dialogue keep you coming. In fact, every cutscene is different dialogue depending on which partner you have equipped. And I think it's also time to bring up the other Paper Mario game I adore, Super Paper Mario. This game may not have the dialogue, but makes up for the fact that it has three pits of 100 trials. The flip side one, the flop side one, and the one in Chapter 6. So overall, I give Paper Mario Thousand Year Door 10 out of 10 just for just being so darn good. Just like Chapter 3.